he, he discussed is that um, the report estimated that the annual global investment needed to avoid the worst impacts of climate change could be limited to about 1% of global GDP, GDP each year if action started now. And this was to um, reach a stabilization point of 500 parts per million, which, by the way, James Hansen would tell you is way too high. Um, he's actually talking about us somehow going backwards from 380 to 350, which I don't see where the political willpower will come for that. But let's use Stern as just at least a jump off point. And he says, but if we wait, um, so the 1% now would be 5 to 20% in the future. Um, as far as the climate impacts to our, our economy. And our, uh, so we can either spend money now or spend it later. I'm an insurer, uh, insurance guy by heart, so from a risk management point of view, it seems worthwhile to be active on the issue now. Um, but to show you how difficult anything below 550 would actually be, the calculation has been that to stabilize emissions at 450 or below, we would need to reach one ton of CO2 a year per capita. To give you some idea of how difficult that may be to reach, the average American or Canadian per capita emissions is 20 tons um, a year. The average worldwide is four tons, and only the poorest are at one ton, poorest of the poor. Um, to put this in perspective, the average person from Alberta, I'm gonna pick on Alberta and Texas for a little bit, um, his uh, 60 tons per, um, emission, uh, per capita emissions, or a Texan with their 28 tons of emissions would need to somehow get to one ton, um, coupled with somehow simultaneously moving China, whose emissions are now five tons per capita, down to one ton, while keeping India at one ton. Um, so the key point is that it's not going to be sufficient to limit emissions in the prosperous parts of the world and allow the less fortunate to catch up. Such an outcome would overwhelm the planet. The emissions of the future risk must eventually equal the emissions of today's poor, not the other way around. So the magnitude of the solution or the risk management problem, as I mentioned, I come out of the insurance industry, and there's a lot of things we buy um, insurance for that have less than a 1% likelihood of occurring. Uh, if you drive a car, you can't actually drive a car legally with that insurance, for instance, right? You can't get a mortgage if you don't have um, uh, homeowner's insurance. And yet the likelihood in any year or in any decade of uh, your house burning down or you being in an accident is probably less than 1%. Um, yet on, on this issue, we have 99% of the scientists, scientific community telling us we should be acting, we should be doing everything we can to mitigate this issue, and yet we still haven't done everything we can. Um, so even if they're only likely to be right on about 1% basis, shouldn't we be acting? I mean, pure risk management would tell us we need to be acting. And acting means to be both on adaptation and mitigation simultaneously. They're not mutually exclusive. The environmental community has been notoriously bad, to be frank, about adaptation because it felt like it was a surrender if we started talking about adaptation and not to work on the issue of um, mitigation. Um, and I, I just love this, this slide about the polar bears and saying that if, if the seals weren't going to be around, they can actually now live on humans. Um, but just to give you an idea on adaptation, um, you know, it's been the forgotten stepchild of dealing with our um, climate change future. While estimates for supporting uh, future adaptation needs vary, they all far exceed the amounts currently available. Estimates for the developing world alone is 9 billion to 86 billion to help them adapt on an annual basis. Or, to put it in another perspective, it's less than what the insurance industry pays out year in and year, in and year out now on um, claims for storm related damages. So just to put it a little bit in perspective, because obviously the climate of the future will lead to more insurance uh, claims, although not unfortunately in the developed world, uh, developing world where they don't actually have insurance um, capacity. For mitigation, um, the examples uh, that the famous examples uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, Robert Sokolow from uh, Princeton, and he talks about uh, in his stabilization wedges, what would you need to do? What's the magnitude of what needs to be done um, to, to address the issue? And he gives um, 15 energy choices, which um, he talks about there's seven that you would need to fully admit, uh, to adopt. And so for instance, for nuclear, um, you would need to build 700 new nuclear power plants to equal the one gigaton of carbon out of the atmosphere year in and year out from now to 2050. 
that's three times the global capacity right now of nuclear. Um, basically, whose backyard they, uh, these are going to be put in. Wind. A wedge requires deployment of at least 30 million hectares of 2 megawatt wind turbines, or an area the size of the state of Wyoming. For solar, a wedge of P, um, uh, photovoltaics would be equivalent to the landmass of the state of New Jersey. Now, as a New Yorker, actually, I like that. I think it's a good use of the state of New Jersey. Um, energy efficiency, double energy efficiency um, in, in autos and appliances. And prevention of deforestation, um, halting deforestation completely, so complete stop and reforesting 300 million hectares of currently non-forested land worldwide would get you a wedge. And there's a lot of others, but what I always liked about the wedges was that it actually practically said what would be the magnitude and what needed to be done. And then McKinsey has done a lot of studies after that um, on basically cost curve studies, um, which basically showed how to prioritize, which ones do you do first? And all their studies actually start with efficiency. Efficiency is the place to start. It's the lowest hanging of lowest hanging fruit. Um, at the Climate Group, um, we had done a series of uh, publications called Carbon Down, Profits Up, where um, over the years we reviewed about 500 um, entities, both governments and companies. And it was interesting. We had yet to find a company or a government that actually had suffered economic harm for tackling climate change or for cutting emissions significantly. The average company or entity had um, cut emissions by about 18 percent. And yet everyone did it on a basically a no cost or even on a for profit basis because energy efficiency was such a low hanging fruit that they recovered their costs almost completely. Um, and McKinsey actually backs that up by saying that um, showing that 25% of all actions required, um, including fuel efficiency and building insulation, can be done at no net cost uh, to the economy. So then, what's the magnitude of the opportunity? Um, you know, our description of uh, what's an optimist or pessimist is we look at a glass as whether it's half filled or not. But as someone recently said to me, you know, glass is never actually um, half filled; it's actually always filled. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, because we discount the atmosphere in, 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 in class. It's always there. And that's actually how you could look at how we've treated this issue. And anything being put into the atmosphere was discounted. It was, it was a no cost. And so now people are, are, are complaining that there's going to be a cost imposed on them for, for things that had not done uh, previously for free. So it is hoped that putting a price on carbon, as you've done here at BC, will change that. However, there are huge impediments, both socially, economically, and politically. Just to run through a, a few quick ones. Socially, well, what are we dealing with? The CO2 is an invisible gas. The cumulative effects of emissions are gradual. And then serious co uh, consequences appear to occur to someone else's backyard, right? It's the next generation's issue. It's not my issue. It seems to be far away. So how do you get people to focus? And what I like is, uh, uh, Columnist um, Bill McKibben has a good way of putting this in perspective. He says, you know, if I was a high school guidance counselor, he says, you know, and a student approached me, what would I advise them to do knowing what I know about climate change? And so there's some kind of humorous examples, right? He says, oh, I wouldn't um, advise them to be Everglades tour operators, or nap or Spanish wine growers, or Alp ski school operators, or South Pacific coral um, scuba uh, tour operators, or could I maybe add um, BC loggers? Um, to that. Um, but then, interestingly, and this is again going into my insurance background, he says, you know, I would not advise them to be actuaries. Why not actuaries? Well, because the past will not be an accurate predictor of the future, so who needs actuaries? And yet, it's interesting because actuaries are always rated year in and year out as one of the best jobs possible because they're almost recession proof. Um, and they're usually high paying, etc. But to, to, to kind of explore this a little further, almost every major endeavor of economic activity has some predictive element to it, where we rely on past environmental conditions to predict future exposures, tolerances, or behavior. The insurance industry is certainly based on that, but it's not just insurance, it's mortgages, it's financial ratings, crop plantings, construction, uh, all based on the experience of the past being an accurate predictor of the future. Um, to give you a few examples of where there's been some proactivity on this is um, Seattle recently, um, in redesigning their water treatment plants, they looked at um, the one in 100 year event, which was their standard, um, and they said, well, you know, if uh, the, what climatologists tell us about Seattle is that we're going to get the same amount of rain, but it's going to fall in more intense uh, quantities. And therefore, the one in 100 year scenario probably is not the scenario we need to be planning against. It's more than 250. So that's what they did. And so they actually tried to anticipate what the climate of the future, because it's a 50-year lifespan to this infrastructure. 
Um, and I, yet I would argue that we haven't done that comprehensively as a society. Uh, I was in Miami recently and talking to uh, Dade County supervisor, and he, was, he looks out on Biscayne Bay and he says, you know, um, all that land you see out there won't be here, and it's two mortgage cycles away. And he says, if you think about the subprime um, loan crisis, he says, well, subprime loan, at least you had some underlying value to the home. He says, this won't be here. Um, and yet, how much of the infrastructure of Miami is also set up around that? So just to give you some ideas of the perspectives, the Dutch actually are very proactive on this issue. For instance, they plan on a one in 1,000 year um, event for their dikes, and they're saying that's not enough for the North Sea and the potential, and they're going to one in 10,000 years now to raise that level of the dikes, as is London with the Thames, saying the one in 1,000 year scenario is perhaps not enough as well. Economically, and I just want to touch on this a little bit, is the whole financial infrastructure now needs to factor in a whole long-term issue, both climate exposure and emissions reductions. Um, you think about accounting. In Europe, um, PwC did a study and they, they found that most of the companies complying with the EU ETS, the emissions trading scheme there, were actually applying different accounting standards. They couldn't measure one even part of the business against another part of the business because they were all using different standards because no one had to actually come up with a, a uniform standard yet. And if I look at North America, FASB, or the Financial Standards Accounting Board, has not actually gone forward yet with standards as to how companies need to account for this. And that's on the emissions level, let alone how do you account for climate vulnerability. Walmart, for instance, buys an insurance policy to protect against the Panama Canal actually not having enough water to lift the boats because there's a lot of concern as to with changes in, in the climate conditions that there may not be enough rainfall for the Panama Canal and just-in-time delivery will not be just-in-time. So um, they're looking at how they could actually um, mitigate those potential losses. But financial disclosure is another huge issue. SEC um, says that you have to report material um, uh, concerns, right, in, in, in your financial reporting. And yet, what could be potentially more uh, material than that you have now a huge potential liability? Because there's no one that can tell you that, you know, here in Canada or in the U.S., that uh, carbon isn't going to have a price shortly. And so, therefore, how, why aren't you having to report this? Um, financial ratings, I think this is a, a huge disgrace right now, is that, you know, if you think about the subprime loan and how they got this wrong, um, and because they weren't projecting and thinking about all the contingencies, um, climate exposure ratings um, have not been factored into muni bonds, corporate bond ratings, evaluations of real estate trusts. Um, and in insurance, interestingly, um, you know, insurance is a fundamental for, the, um, for economic well-being, right? It's an enabler of economic activity. Without insurance, no one takes the risk to do something. And yet, insurers have not been required to talk about what climate risk they're potentially encountering. Um, so there is now, in the, in the U.S., for instance, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which is a regulatory body, has just decided that they have, they're forcing insurers to disclose in 2010 um, both their um, exposure to climate change risks, so they have to look at their portfolio, but as well as their investment portfolio, because if you think about insurance as a bet, can they hold your money longer than you need it? And um, so there could be a potential, are they all investing, for instance, in coal industries, for instance, that are now going to have and potential stock um, change because of uh, price on carbon. So this brings me to the, to the many. Um, politically, while our political systems have been in um, a cause of much delay in making progress in dealing with climate change, I feel we have now turned the corner. Certainly, your recent elections here in BC reinforced to me, and I am sure for politicians across the country, or across the continent even, is that renewed um, political willpower on this issue is here. Um, the public is, is interested. As someone who's worked on this issue though for the last 10 years, um, it's interesting to see how things have evolved and devolved on the issue. 10 years ago, um, and I heard Olden Donnelly, by the way, before I um, speak, and she was one of the first people I met here on climate change. And um, Canada was viewed as the leader, the global leader. I mean, I actually, the first things I did on climate change were in Canada. I was living in Switzerland at the time, and yet I was over here all the time because this was going to be the place that was going to act first. EU was not anywhere on the radar screen. The EU actually didn't want to do cap and trade. They didn't want to do a market mechanism. And the US, well, we were hoping that Al Gore was going to become president and it looked like there was going to be a US leadership, but obviously that worked out differently. Um, so, um, but if you ran forward, now the EU is the biggest advocate um, on a market mechanism. Um, unfortunately, you don't need to have me tell you about Canada, but um, 
for the U.S. now, the U.S. is, I believe, poised to actually take over the global mantle. Why? Because, for instance, the EU doesn't have a leader as it had in the past with someone like Tony Blair, who was actually someone that rallied behind. So there's a need for fresh leadership as well as China and India are saying, the U.S. needs to put its cards on the table. We don't trust you unless you do. So there's really an opportunity. And, and President Obama, I think, has been very clear from the start. He's going to move on this issue. But he makes it on an on order of priorities, which is interesting. It's about national security first. It's about the U.S. ability to compete and create green jobs second. Third, it's this climate crisis um, thing. So just to put it in perspective. Um, and I think it's very interesting to see how the administration is moving. Um, they're looking at it both from a legislative point of view, but as well as from a regulatory. And I'm just going to touch very lightly on this because I know you guys are talking about this tomorrow. But on the legislative side of things, there's this huge um, activity now going on in various states, right? You have the Reggie Initiative on the East Coast, you have Florida, you have um, the West Coast, and you have now the Midwest Group. So industry is petrified that this patchwork quilt of uh, regulation would come. So they all of a sudden have uh, banded together in things like US CAP, for instance, to, to advocate. So that's been the change because it actually took away the, the one um, argument you always heard was that industry doesn't want this. So that was the excuse for congressmen or senators to not deal with it. We're, we're gonna, in, industry's not ready for this. Well, industry now is ready because they're worried about what the alternative is. And um, so there's been a key piece of legislation introduced called the American Clean Energy and Securities Act in, in the House. 800 page bill, I'm nowhere going to talk about it, any of the details on it. But basically to give you an idea of the, just the, the top line, it talks about a 2005 baseline for emissions by 2012, cutting that by 3%, by 2020, 20%, and 2050, 83%. It also has an adaptation component where it's requiring NOAA to look at where the U.S. would need to adapt, which I think is a good start. Um, the Senate, so the House actually may pass a bill this year. Actually, I'm optimistic. I do think the House will pass a bill this year. The Senate is going to be the battleground. And the Senate, the Senate is interesting because that's always been where all the, all the bills in the past have been, but really with no hope of passage. Um, and the key votes, just to remember there, is 60 votes um, for passage of legislation, 67 votes to pass a treaty. So for Copenhagen or Son of Kyoto, or whatever you want to call it, um, there will be um, a real need to make sure that you gather up these um, basically conservative Democrats in the Midwest that need to be convinced. Because if you look at the vote, and just taking the um, Lieberman Werner vote last year, um, that was the closest proxy you got. Well, where did the senators vote? They voted in all the states that took action on the local level. Reggie, East Coast, Florida, West Coast, um, California, Oregon, Washington. All those senators voted for the bill. Where were the kind of mixed votes? The Midwest and the IAD Hauju vote was in the South. Just totally against, and that's probably a hopeless vote. But in the Midwest, it's how do you get there? And so that's going to be the calculus that um, Obama has to go through. And what I think is very interesting is he's simultaneously to be a prod for this is he's looking at the regulatory approach. And uh, as an ex litigator, actually, I think this is very interesting because it's uh, basically what he's saying is that based on the Supreme Court ruling um, uh, two years ago in Massachusetts versus EPA, you now have um, basically a potential liability under the Clean Air Act for your CO2 emissions. And not that I, by the way, advocate in any way, shape, or form this needs to go the asbestos route because this would be a nightmare in, in courts. And, probably be only a pension fund for lawyers and we'll all be uh, um, suffering up here in British Columbia with Florida type weather. Um, but it is an interesting scenario. Just to give you an idea of how others are taking this seriously, my former employer, Swiss Re, just issued a report last week that stated, we expect that climate change related liability would depend, develop more quickly than asbestos related claims and believe that frequency of claim change, claim, climate change uh, related litigation um, could become a significant issue within the next couple of years. So what's the outlook for um, uh, Copenhagen? Um, no deal without getting the BRIC countries involved. So um, what, where does that go? Well, Brazil, for instance, is focused on uh, prevention of deforestation. So a deal has to be cut with them to preserve their forests, to preserve the lungs of the planet, as you could say. Um, and I think there's a real good chance to get there. I think there's some narrowing um, that could be done, and I'm working on an initiative where the insurance industry potentially could help risk manage that. So um, I think that could be really interesting. 
just having spent the last four weeks in, in Russia, um, I just wanted to mention that it was a very pleasant surprise to see Russia actually now, who had been characterized as just one big silence at Copenhagen, Russia was saying nothing. Um, Russia has come out and said now that they realize that climate change will have significant impact to Russia. And if you think about Russia and Canada, we were basically what got Kyoto over, um, got Kyoto passed a few years ago. So it's actually quite significant. This is still about 6% of global emissions. China and India, though, are going to be obviously the big issues. And um, last year, both have introduced the national plans to tackle climate change, prioritizing renewable energy sources. Um, India's environmental secretary, though, has said that um, the West must get serious about cutting its own emissions if it wants to progress on this issue. India's position is that it would not compromise its 8% economic growth rate. I imagine this was a little bit of an older quote. Um, but arguing that it was historical polluters in the industrialized West who must take action first. Um, at the heart of India's position, though, and this is where it's really interesting, is that India, whose population is to reach 1.5 billion um, in um, 2050, must be allowed to pollute on a per capita basis with the West. So if it's the average Albertan, we're in Venus, basically, on, uh, uh, as far as what, what the heat will be. Um, India's emissions are, in, but on an aggregated basis, India has to be brought to the table. They will be the second largest emitter by 2050. Um, and so therefore they need to be a participant. The world's largest emitter now is China. It was 10 years ahead of what the IEA, International Energy Association, predicted what China would be. Um, huge growth in emissions and because of its huge uh, coal um, base um, for its uh, power generation. I think it adds the um, power capacity of the UK year in and year out um, in, in coal burning plants. Economist Jeff Sachs last week said, um, at a, a, an Asia Society event that um, any realistic path forward uh, must include, uh, for China, a heavy reliance on coal. He says this leaves the developed world with no choice but to develop the use of carbon capture and storage technology, despite the fact that it's never been successfully implemented on the grand scale. Um, so basically he feels CCS or we don't get there. And he says, regarding China's leadership on the issue, China leadership takes this issue very seriously, but China's leadership also takes very seriously the issue of economic development. They want to catch up to the West. In other words, these, those coal plants won't be shut down anytime soon. Um, China, however, and this is more an optimistic view, or um, well, my view, I guess you could say, is moving toward a low-carbon economy anyway. Um, at the Climate Group last year, our China office actually presented a report called China's Clean Energy Revolution. And after reading the report, um, I said, wow, the subtitle for North Americans should be China Eats Our Lunch. Because all these technologies that I at least had hoped in talking to the people in the Midwest, for instance, saying, oh yeah, that GM plant that got shut down, you're going to be making wind turbines, it'll be fine, it'll keep jobs. Um, probably won't be the case, because China is already the leader provider of uh, solar PV, solar water heaters. And in basically two, three years, it projected to be the largest wind turbine manufacturer in, in the world. And on a per capita basis, they are equal with Germany uh, as the, the largest um, investor in renewable energy of about $12 billion. Um, just one thing I wanted to, to emphasize here as well is that, um, you know, so for, for the many that have to deal with this issue, it, it's, it's great to be storytellers. At the Climate Group, we were storytellers. Um, we actually told the stories of success. Um, we, we took examples of what people have done and, and tried to highlight them and so that others could learn from the examples learned both positive and negative way because the planet can't afford for us to have everyone reinvent the wheel every time. So I think there's huge opportunities and so many positive examples and I was asked to, to give some highlights of them so I just will run through these actually relatively quick. But on, on the um, public sector, for instance, you know, you have 900 mayors in, in, in the U.S. It's signed from the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, signed a Kyoto-esque targets for their cities um, over the last couple of years. I mean, amazing. Um, you know, they took political leadership for their cities. Now, did they have a clue how to get there? Probably not yet. But there are some real positive examples if you look at Boulder and Berkeley um, and, and New York City or Seattle or Miami of real positive examples of what people have been able to do. The C40 initiative is a very interesting initiative, too, um, with the Clinton um, Climate Initiative. And basically, they're serving as a secretary for 40 influential cities around the, the planet, generally, you could say, the largest cities around. 
Um, and what they're doing is actually taking the example that they had with um, AIDS drugs, and they're actually using, uh, basically trying to bundle um, demand so that they could actually put together on energy efficiency, on um, traffic and street lighting, clean buses, et cetera, aggregated demand to lower the prices. Because for the AIDS drugs, they were quite successful. I think it was 75% lower they got um, than the AIDS drugs, for instance. Um, and then there's also a lot of positive examples on, on the, um, the business front, and they're, they're probably almost too numerous to, to go through. Um, you know, there's an interesting one I just saw with Duke Energy, for instance, on a, it was a green tree program uh, where they're going to reforest one million acres of the lower Mississippi Valley. Um, and this will have actually benefits in that it actually preserves uh, wetlands as well, which actually will help storm retention rates. And it's an interesting um, program in that they're actually planting two types of trees, cottonwoods and hardwoods. And the cottonwoods grow fast, so they actually um, will create a canopy almost in three to five years where the cottonwoods can grow underneath. And the idea is that at least in the land, um, and this project will eventually, one million acres, um, will allow the landowners to own the land, um, select harvesting of some of the, of the tree species, but actually pay the, the forest, uh, pay the landholders to keep them forested. So it's a very interesting and innovative program. Um, Johnson and Johnson, for instance, had an innovative financial structure, which, to meet its goals of uh, a seven percent emissions reduction by 1990, uh, created a capital relief fund because these projects were not actually being funded um, on their own right due to internal rates of return. And it's been interesting in that in, in looking at the issue and, the, and putting together a team that actually sought out projects, their internal rate of return has actually risen to 15% um, on uh, any of the energy efficiency projects they did. And they expect to save about 90,000 tons of carbon year in and year out. And this is not a small amount of money. They've actually invested $40 million um, on this. And consumer engagement, just to show you just the span of innovation, is Timberland um, has actually looked at um, it has created nutritional labels for their car, for their, um, on their boxes for their boots, um, which is basically stating the number, instead of stating the number of servings or calories, it actually talks about renewable energy use and carbon um, content. And Tesco, for instance, has done uh, a, a number of things with, with labeling, for instance, of uh, buy air labels um, so that the British consumer knows what goods are actually being flown in and therefore maybe that's the strawberries from Chile you don't want to eat right now because they have a huge carbon component on it. But it's interesting as well is they put a um, very simple thing on their clothing, please wash your cold. And you would say, well, what would that do? Well, actually, for the average UK household, that saves about 10% of the energy bill if they would actually just wash their clothes and vote. So simple actions that could actually have profound effects. And then on the innovation side, I like um, this project that the Project Better Place um, in California is interested in doing, which is, is that they're working with the government of Israel, Denmark, Hawaii, and a number of other places. Basically, you use the mobile phone model um, for, for car ownership. And the idea is, is that um, you will actually, um, I lost my train here. Okay, yeah, the company's developed a model that takes from the mobile phone industry and combines transportation with renewable energy generation to revolutionize the way they drive. Drivers pay to access the network of charging spots and battery exchanges, which are powered by renewable energy, and they, are only, they only pay for the miles they drive. So in essence, the car is almost disposable, just like your um, mobile phone, and it's basically you're paying for the service of, of being able to use this. Interestingly, it's better place to think that once they scale up and that they actually uh, get to use more renewables into the electrical system um, that will power the cars, because you can power these batteries overnight, for instance, um, they will actually save about 40%. Uh, so finally, in closing, um, over the last 10 years, there's been kind of a search for historical precedents to compare what we need to do um, on this issue. People, there's uh, been references to, let's make it a moonshot, right, on the Apollo mission. Um, you know, the references to the Cold War, etc. Unfortunately, due to the global scale and scope of this undertaking, I believe there is no single global uh, good precedent, rather a few that you could combine and take the best of the examples. For instance, the Montreal Protocol um, to address the hole in the ozone layer. The highlight of the story was a global agreement. Public opinion solidified very quickly in advance of the science on the issue, and it was a pleasant surprise. 
Um, there were effective technology assessments and, and it demonstrated the importance of good leadership. The shortcomings of this, uh, on this ex example was that the, the task force, the task appeared easy compared to climate change. Small number of actors in manufacturing opposition dropped away and came up with alternatives. Um, but I think it is enlightening in the sense of showing that a global um, collaborative effort. The eradication, eradication of smallpox. The highlights of this global story were major success of the UN, um, international uh, global cooperation and participation down to the smallest villages in, in, in Africa, for instance, which contrasts the Montreal Protocol, which only needed involvement of large industrial players. In the US, the Clean Air Act, um, highlighted that story, huge reductions were beyond what anyone expected to address acid rain. It was the birth in, in major legislation of a market-based approach. The lessons learned that a price on the f formerly free ride of socks and knocks can catalyze social technology transformation. The downside was it was a regionalized and local pressure, the acid rain problem in places like New York State and in New England where it created constituencies. So climate change unfortunately still doesn't, in my opinion, have a real constituency. Um, but I think maybe the best example is World War II. Um, global mobilization of all segments of society involved huge logistical and technical innovations. The shortcoming, you could say, was the relatively short term of the war, right, the six years. But if you add the combined effects of the post-war reconstruction of the Marshall Plan, for instance, um, then you might actually have a good comparison because you're talking about this, this probably the time frame, the global nature of it, the global uh, rethink of how society is moving on, or will need to move on this issue. It's probably, the, to me, the best example. But somehow we need to combine all these lessons um, learned of all these uh, major initiatives and figure out how to maintain them for decades. That's going to be the challenge. So, but should we succeed? Perhaps we will be able then to follow Churchill's original formation of the quote, which was the next, where the next generation will say, never in the course of human events have so many owed so much to so few, or hopefully so many, and even add, this was their finest hour. Thank you.